So Luke 23 is where we're at. Hopefully you're there by now. A couple weeks ago, I mean, obviously I wasn't here last week, but we were talking about Jesus and he was beginning this being pulled from house to house and going through all these smaller trials that were actually illegal to begin with. And he was getting pulled through them all. And, and then we saw that they, the hatred that they had for Jesus and the beatings that they were giving Jesus and the game they would play where they would put something over a blindfold on his head and then punch him and say, probably prophesy who struck you and all these different things. We see the hate that they have for him. And then we see here in verse uh, 67 of chapter 62. 62 of 22. Sorry. (laughs) That's a long book. It says, uh, if you are the Christ, tell us. Right? That's what they're yelling at him. And it says, but he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Jesus realized that this group was so hardened and so hard-hearted that nothing was going to change them. And we left off on a hilarious but hilariously tragic video of Stephen Colbert and I think his name is Bart Ehrman, the guy that wrote a book that, about the contradictions in the Bible and all these things. And for us, everything he's saying is crazy because we know how the Gospels work together and the Gospels show us different things about Jesus and all these these different I mean it was it was inspired and written by the Holy Spirit so we know that it's perfect right but he's sitting and looking at it and he knows what each and every one of those books says and yet he's missing the point completely and in our lives and, and in the in the Pharisees lives and the chief priests and all these people's lives the same exact thing was happening they knew what the word said but they were missing it they were completely missing the whole point. So now, um, you know, we ended as we always end services, it seems like, uh, in prayer and our friends that, that don't know the Lord. And I encourage you to pray for them and the friends that have been shown the truth over and over and over again. And you ask yourself, how can they not see it? It's because we know that they have blinders on their eyes and their heart has been hardened. And we prayed for those people. And I believe that God is doing a work in all those people's lives as we begin to pray. Amen. So now we are here with the trial of Jesus. So let's turn to, uh, once again, Luke 23, verses 1 through 25. It says, Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. The Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, he said, it is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were more fierce, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked, the man, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when, he, when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired a long time to see him because he had heard of the many things about him and he had hoped to see some miracle done by him then he questioned him with many words but he answered him nothing and the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him then Herod with his men uh, with his men of war treated him with contempt and mocked him arrayed him with a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate that very day Pilate and Herod became friends with each other for previously they had been at enmity with each other then Pilate when he had called together the chief priests the rulers and the people said to them you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people and indeed having examined him in your presence I find no no fault in this man concerning those things of which you have accused him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary um, for, for him to release one of them, uh, one of them all, uh, sorry, at the feast. And they cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus again, called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them a third time, Why, what has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I, I, will, there, I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they, uh, but they were more, ins- they were insistent, demanding with loud voices, 
that he uh, that he be crucified. And the voices of these men of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested, and he released he released to them the one as they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he yeah, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just love you, and we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for the people here. Lord, we just pray right now, Lord, as we just jump into this, uh, this awesome account, Lord God, of, of true life things that happened, the Lord, that, Lord, I just pray, Lord God, that we could just look at it, Lord, and we could learn, Lord, that we could apply this to our lives, Lord God. And so, Lord, I just, uh, I know that every person here, Lord God, is here for a reason, and I know that you have a plan and a calling for each one. And so, Lord, I just pray, Lord God, that this would be a place, Lord, also to you, if it's their first time, Lord, that they'd feel love, and they'd feel that there's something different about this place. So, Lord, I just pray right now, Lord God, that you would be at the center, Lord God, that you would be moving with your Holy Spirit from person to person, doing something that only your Holy Spirit can do, Lord. Everything that comes out of this is just words without your power. So, Lord, send your power here, Lord God. Break down hearts, Lord God. Soften hearts, Lord. Build hearts. Do everything that only you can do. And Lord Jesus, we sit in awe and reverence of how amazing and how awesome you are. And Lord, that we can meet here and and do this with all the blessings, Lord God, that you've given us here at Joshua Springs. Lord God, thank you for this group of believers. Lord God, um, once again, we just pray against any distractions, Lord God. We just pray that this would be a time of spirit speaking to spirit. And we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's go ahead and look at the first couple of verses. It says... Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this, uh, uh, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ and king. Basically, at this time, we get to see another man that we have heard about, even in the book of Luke. But we get to meet him here right now, so let's go ahead and meet Pontius Pilate. We know that he was a Roman governor of Judea. He really... um uh, he, this is a man that actually really existed, right? I know that sometimes uh, for us when we're doing Bible studies, I know that my whole life growing up, I always pictured this stuff happening, but I kind of pictured it like a movie, like almost like it wasn't real. This is real history. This is something that people, historians talk about, not just Bible stories. This is real life. This is, this is everyone agrees that this man existed and that these things happened. And when we view it through being a history lesson of Jesus, we can grow and learn so much. So somehow don't become disconnected with it. Become absolutely connected with it because this is our king and this is our savior. And this is from the most real point of view that you could possibly see. So we know that he was a a Roman governor and Jerusalem fell into his area. And Pilate had a history of hard times with the Jews, right? We know that uh, Flavius Josephus, who talks about him in, in some of his writings, but he, he mentioned something along the lines, and I could be a little bit off on this, but basically he was making an aqueduct, and he was taking water. Uh, basically his idea was to take water from over like 43 miles or 70 kilometers away and bring it into uh, his land. And basically he needed money, so he started taking money from the Jewish treasury, and uh, which is called the Carbonas, which is basically at that point, um, it, it, what that is, is it's, it's a part of the treasury that is allotted for the community as well as other things like that. Um, we don't really know exactly what happened as far as why everyone got so upset, if he was taking the money illegally, if he had had someone on the inside that started taking the money, or if the people just didn't agree with him taking money for this reason. But we do know that the Jews started to rise up against him and they started to not agree with him. And where he would go, people would surround him and they would start yelling and they would start making their protests. So just so you can get a picture of the man we're dealing with here, Pontius Pilate decides he's going to have a whole bunch of his men and a whole bunch of soldiers dress as Jewish men in the same Jewish clothes they wear. And the next time that they go out, he's going to have them mingled and, and sitting around all of them. 
And so next time that happened, they come out and they start to talk to Pontius and they start to tell them their grievances towards what he's doing and they begin to surround them and you see that the, the guards go all the way around them but you know, to, the, to their demise they couldn't even see and basically at that point these men that were dressed as them beat the Jews with clubs and uh, you know, for whatever reason either they were ordered to do so or they did so because they got too excited and just went just beat down crazy they killed a whole bunch of the Jews just for arguing with Pontius Pilate. This is the man we're dealing with. This is the man that they're bringing him. We also know that he was a brutal man, right? We know that in Luke 13, 1, uh, it's very short there, but he's also mentioned, and basically the verse says this, there were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So obviously at this point, there was some people that were bringing sacrifice and basically were murdered. His job description at this point would be to collect taxes and to oversee building projects and to keep order, which he wasn't doing a real good job with the Jews, was he? Right? The Jews did not like him. And you know what? He thought that since he was in charge, he could do all this by force. And he was on his last legs with the Jews. And the last thing he would want to happen in his life and in his job is for the Jews to go to Rome and start complaining about this man being unfair and doing all these things. And, and he's, he's doing just, just, he's killing our people. And this is the man you have in charge. Because if Rome comes by and pulls you out of, of leadership for something like that, there's a good chance you yourself are going to get your head chopped off or you're going to get killed. So he definitely didn't want that to happen. And the Jews know to legally kill Jesus, to get what they wanted to have happen, they had to bring him before Pilate. And that's why we see in verse 1, then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. It's not that they wanted to, it's that they had to, to legally kill Jesus. And we see here, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is the Christ. Man, they knew that Pilate could literally care less about anything they had to bring up, right? Pilate's the type that likes to hit him with clubs. So we know for a fact that they knew before going to, to, to Pilate that they were going to say, we don't like the way he threatens our way of living. You know, we don't like that, that you know, he calls himself our savior. We don't, we don't like any of these things. And he was just going to be like, whatever. Like, I, I'm tired of hearing you guys get out of here. But when you start off by saying he's perverting the nation forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and he claimed to be king, that's something that they thought for sure a pilot would have to listen to. So the first one, what are they accusing him of when they say perverting the nation? Basically, it was, it was teaching against something that they didn't like. It was teaching against the way that they had always been taught, and they didn't like that. And in doing so, that's kind of true. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law, right? And Jesus knew that these, these Pharisees and these leaders were giving all these laws and stuff that they couldn't live themselves. And if you missed Sunday morning, Gerald spoke on hypocrisy. That is what they were doing to a T. They were speaking things that were too hard for you guys to, to, to live up to, the, to the people to live up to, and yet they weren't doing them themselves at all. So basically, that's the first one. The, sex, the second one is forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, inciting riots over taxes. And we know that that's not true because we have read the account of what he really said. To pay, he said, what, what, did, what did Jesus say about paying taxes? Render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what's God's, right? He didn't say don't pay your taxes. And then they're saying that he's going in direct defiance of King Caesar and that he's trying to be raised up as, as king of Rome and the king of all this area. And so at that point, um, it's so funny that in our lives, it's, it's the same way that these people do. They have to make up some of the craziest things about Jesus for, for anyone to ever listen to them, right? If they were to say, Jesus is a defender of the weak, he's the healer of the sick, he performed miracles, and he died for our sins, and it's as easy as accepting him to be saved. A lot of people would be like, oh. But there's a lot of people that make up a lot of things about Jesus, don't they? Right? There's a lot of people that represent Jesus pretty poorly too, don't they? People would literally have to cling to their sin and run from Jesus when they hear about his grace and not believe. 
And we know that people's hearts can be that hardened. We know that people, you know, can make stuff up about Jesus because their hearts are so hardened about, I don't even know if Jesus existed. That is maybe the stupidest thing that anyone's ever said. It's been, there's tons and tons and tons of proof that Jesus existed. When I heard another one too, that Jesus wasn't actually Jesus. He was this other guy that, oh man, I don't even know. It's so, it's so ridiculous that he was some, uh, you know, oh man, I, I'm not even into it. But Jesus wasn't Jesus. His name was something, something, something. And he was, a, he was a crazy person that everyone knew. And it's just like, oh my gosh, right? But you have to make up something. You have to say something. But I'll tell you, one thing that always is in my life that I always do my best, um, and, and I'm not saying that I walk out with flying colors all the time, but is for myself not to be a poor representation of who Jesus is. Right? Because a lot of times, we, we use that a lot in the service, but a lot of times people are going to look at you and they want to see what Jesus is like. So let's, let, let's not let ourselves be a poor excuse of who Jesus is. Let's love them like Jesus did. Let's show them who Jesus is and was through his ministry by the way we live our own lives. But we see Pilate here, and they're bringing up all these crazy accusations about Jesus, none of them which were being true. And we see here in verse 3, it says, Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priest in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. We need to look in those verses because as we, I, I picture everything almost like a... Like a like a visual. I like visuals. So I picture Jesus. He's already been beaten. His face is marred. He's got just, just, I mean, he literally has taken all the, 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 the force of have being blindfolded and punched um, repeatedly. And so we see that he's a bloody mess here. And we see that Pilate is sitting and Pilate's in a good situation, right? Pilate is a Roman leader. Pilate's sitting here and looking at Jesus and Jesus is a mess, and now you can kind of see how, how Pilate delivers that question, right? He, Pilate's in a good spot. Jesus in a bad spot. Are you the king of the Jews? I mean, really? You're here and you're completely beaten up. And you, so you're the king of the Jews. And what did Jesus answer to him? It is as you say. And you see Pilate looking out at all the people and all the Jews and how angry and how passionate they are. A strange, a strange scene indeed, a strange situation. He's probably never seen anything quite as much as how personal this was for each and every one of them. And, you know, um, basically, Pilate may have, been, may have been a lot of things, but he wasn't an idiot. And he sees all these Jews yelling and shouting and getting angry. And, and yeah, this man is accused of having us not pay taxes. Okay. Yeah, right. The Jews hated Rome, right? In fact, if there was someone walking around saying, don't pay taxes, he would probably be like lifted up on a shoulder or something, right? So basically, he sees him and he knows that what this is, this is, a per- this is personal. The Jews hated Rome. There's something going on here. And he says right here, he says, so Pilate said to the chief priest in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. Five through seven, it says, but then, sorry, but they were more fierce, saying he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. And when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked the man if he were a Galilean. And as soon as they knew that uh, that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at this time. This part of the message is kind of hilarious, right? So he, it, either way you look at it, Pilate's not stoked that these people are here yelling and screaming about Jesus and making up all this stuff about him and, and saying all these things. And so um, basically at this point, Pilate says he has no fault. It says that they grew in strength. Basically that word there means growing in strength, that fierce word. They begin to get more angry and yelling more and more and more. And as soon as, as, soon as they say these words and as soon as it says right here, he stirs up the people teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place, his ears perk up. Galilee, you say? Oh, that's not my jurisdiction. I don't, have, I don't need to deal with this issue. All right, Herod, where you at, Herod? You know, just super excited to get rid of him at this point. You know, because he knew that his relationship with these Jewish people were on thin ice. And it very well could have been the last strike before they, they, go, to, they go and get him killed. So he passes him off to Herod Antipas. 
So let's go ahead and meet him. Herod too was a governor of a different region. His father was the madman, right? His father was Herod the Great, who you can read about in the Bible as well. And turn with me to Mark 6, uh, Mark 6, 12 through 29. Mark 6, 12 through 29. This is a story of Herod here, the same Herod. This is probably the story that he's known most for. Mark 6, 12 through 29. It says, So they went out and preached that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil those who were sick and healed them. Now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known, as, and, and he said, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and there, therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I have beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. They're trying to figure everything out here. And it says in verse 17, for Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her says right here, because John had said to her, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king, uh, the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, whatever you ask, I will give, uh, give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, I, the head of John the Baptist. And immediately she came in with haste to the king saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the, king's, and the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths and, uh, and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent an executioner, commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to the mother. When the, all the disciples heard of it, they came and took away the corpse and laid it in a tomb. That is what he is known for probably most in the Bible. All right. This man basically had a bunch of noblemen over a bunch of people that he was that were highly respected. Basically, uh, his his wife um, had a had a good looking daughter, and she had her dance for, uh, for for Herod here. And Herod got a little bit probably a little bit drunk, and as well as just falling completely in lust, right? And he just says something stupid: "I'll give you whatever you want." You know, and she's like, and he's like, even half my kingdom, what do you want? And she's like, oh, I want the head of John the Baptist. Well, there was, there was an issue, right? And so he didn't want to let down all of his friends. And so, you know, he decided to make the, the wrong decision and go kill an innocent man. We're going to see the very similar thing happen once again. We're going to see that he, his, his, uh, his history and his life isn't one that uh, is you know, marked by making good decisions, right? And, and one that's uh, caves to everything that people have to say. We even know that uh, basically the way his life ended was Herodias had encouraged him to go and, and um, go for the, the title of the word king. And basically there was people that came up and, and said that he was... Um, Basically saying that he was trying to overthrow, and at that point, he um, um, basically got banished, him and his wife, from, from where he was at. And uh, he, he died banished. He died not being able to go back. And so we see that this is the man that now they're bringing it to. Isn't it weird, like, now that you know the backstory of these people, like, the whole person and the whole situation becomes totally different, right? So now you know these two people that we're dealing with, and we see here, and it says in verse 8, now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he had hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. All right. 
Similar to Pilate. I mean, we have to picture this as well. Similar to Pilate, there's Herod, you know, probably dressed very nicely. And instead of being sarcastic um, to this beaten and bloody man, we see that he has a different thing for Jesus, right? What does he want from Jesus? He wants a miracle, right? He had, he knew where Jesus was. I mean, at this point, Jesus is known everywhere. But right now that I have Jesus and he's beaten and destroyed, show me a miracle, And you almost look at it and you're like, now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad. You're like, well, that's good. He wanted to see Jesus. But he wanted to see Jesus for what Jesus could do for him. He wanted to see Jesus for an entertainment type person. Like, all right, magic man, do something neat. Everyone at this point had been talking about Jesus. People knew Jesus' ministry and what he was doing. He performed miracles. And instead of seeking him like he could have... The minute he hears that there's this man doing miracles and and going around, he very well could have just followed him around and seen Jesus firsthand, but instead now he's like, glad I found you. Now entertain me. Show me a magic trick. His whole life didn't focus on Jesus, but now that he's here, I might as well get something neat out of him. This is the kind of man Herod was as he looks down at him. Man, and... As I look at this, I think to myself, man, what a tragedy that these people both look at Jesus, the Son of God, and they're missing it completely. Right? And this man is missing it. And I think in my mind, like, how could they do this? But this kind of attitude is so prevalent with believers and unbelievers alike today in our church and in the world that that it, it marks up completely and matches up completely with the same way he was. We have people that really honestly believe, man, if I could just see a miracle, I would believe in the whole Jesus thing. So Jesus, show me a miracle. Right? I would believe if that happened, but not so, because miracles don't produce faith. Right? That's not how it works. Man, it's a condition of the heart. You could show them all the miracles in the world, and it wouldn't do anything for them. It's a condition, it's an absolute condition of the heart. Now, here's another reason why you can know that these people's hearts are so hardened, because there's miracles going around everywhere, all the way around them, and they're putting it to other things. That's how you can prove that their heart is in a hardened spot, that that a miracle, and Jesus in front of them doing a miracle, they would completely miss it. Because if you can see something like childbirth, and you can see something like someone with cancer being healed, and someone that has an addiction being healed, and you you can amount it to anything else but divine intervention from Jesus Christ, then your heart is so hardened that you're the same as Herod. Because that's exactly what Herod did. But now let's look at a contrast of believers. And believers, we know Jesus. We know the stories of Jesus, and we know the ministry of Jesus, and yet sometimes in our life, we treat Jesus more as a miracle worker and nothing more. We spend time with him when we need a miracle. We come to church when we need a miracle. We come to church when things are rough. But man, when things are, things are going well, we don't need him. Do you think that that's the relationship that Jesus wants to have with us? Right? I mean, I remember uh, when 9-11 happened, and it's one of those things where people always talk about, you know exactly where you were, and I I think for sure I know exactly where I was. I was in Shoshone, Idaho, changing out some guy's windshield for window welder, and I was sitting there, and I was doing this thing, and my friend's like, hey man, like, they just flew planes into the World Trade Center, and I'm just like, oh, so we went back to work. And uh, we get there, and basically there's this big thing on the news. We're all going to meet at the park at this time, and all the churches are going to be there combined, and we're going to pray for our nation to come back to the Lord. We're going to pray for all this stuff. And basically the whole park was full of people. I mean, the biggest park we had in Idaho is just full of people. And there was different pastors going up there delivering messages and praying and encouraging people to to get right with the Lord and to to give it over to the Lord. And everyone's heart was so ready. But then they kind of started forgetting about 9-11. Started forgetting about what happened. And that's the rest of it. You know, those people aren't in church anymore. They, they, they needed a miracle then. They needed to feel comfort then. That's the only time they, they spend time with the Lord. 
And our heart should be to, to strive to have an intimate relationship and a sincere relationship with him daily. Not a relationship that's just only based on miracles. You know, I know people that tend to have this scale of how they're doing with the Lord by the amount of blessings that they feel like they're having in their life. And we know that the whole time that Jesus does miracles and amazing things all around us. And we know that Jesus has been doing amazing things and healings and all these different things all around um, both of them, Herod and Pilate. And yet they chose to not even go see him. They could have searched. They could have seen him. But now Herod only wants to be entertained and Pilate only wants to be popular. Right? Right? He only wants to not have his head lost. He only wants, he's only worried about himself. And let me tell you guys something. Miracles still happen today all the time. But I want you to know something. Jesus never walked around and said, everyone come here and look at the miracle man. Right? Look what I can do. Jesus never did it for himself. He did it for people and hurting people. That's why he did miracles. Not to put on a spectacle, not to put on a show, but to help people. That's what miracles are are for. Does healing still happen today? Does praying over someone and them instantly being healed still happen today? Okay, like, I'll do what Jill says. Well, 10 of you believe that. But do healing still happen today? Absolutely. I've seen people with cancer not have cancer anymore. I've seen people that have been sick that said they'd never walk again. I've seen them walk again. I believe healings happen. I believe that, you know, the the faith that we have will heal many. And listen, God hears us as we pray. So I don't say we ever stop praying for miracles. And miracles are a part that comes along with following Jesus Christ. I know that that happens, and I know addictions are destroyed in the name of Jesus. I know that many of you have sat in here with addictions. My best friends have had serious addictions, and you know what? The Lord has freed them from them. People that say that you can never get out of this without some sort of rehab or without some sort of something, they have been delivered by the power of Jesus, and I believe that Jesus is in the miracle business of freeing you from addictions. So if any of you have them in here, Jesus can free you from that. And I believe that there's reconciliations, a miracle of reconciliation that can happen in your family. I've seen families that have hated each other for some reason, and God has put them back together. And I believe that God is still in the business of doing miracles in that area as well. I mean, you you think of a miracle, God is in the business of doing it. God knows exactly what you need, but become aware and alert when a church claims to be a house of miracles. When Jesus seems to take a back seat to the miracles that he does. I've seen some of the most bizarre things be done in the name of Jesus as a miracle. I've seen revivals where people have said, oh, I walk out and my my regular fillings, they were regular, but now I got gold fillings and that's the gold from heaven. You know, as we were praying, as we were praying, literally gold flakes began to float down. And, you know, and these places are, are like pitched to you as house of miracles and these wonderful miracles and all these things. Be very weary of someone that doesn't focus on Jesus, but they focus on all these other things. And listen, I'm not doubting the fact that maybe gold falls from the sky, but it's not from Jesus. If you're not focusing on Jesus, I don't know who it's from. Chew on that for a second. Because all these people that want a miracle right in front of them and right in front of us, all the people that want a miracle, you're missing the biggest miracle of all. That Jesus, perfect, blameless, died on the cross and rose again from from the dead so that we may live. That's the biggest miracle out of all of them because all the healings in the world and all the things in the world that can happen to you that are for good and a miracle, you're still going to die someday. And if you were just dying and going and and that was the end of it, then that would be a, a... One downer to subscribe to, right? Oh, yeah, well, you healed me. And I'm not going to die of cancer. I'm going to die of old age, but I'm still going to die. And there's no end to this, right? I mean, there's there's no heaven. There's no, I'm, I'm not saved. 
But he did the biggest miracle of all by dying on that cross and raising again. And as we focus on him and we focus on that miracle and we focus on, on all of that, the miracles that will happen in our life will be abundant. Because he loves us the same way he loved all those people he interacted with. But like I said, the, the, same, the same way that we can kind of be like Herod and unbelievers can be like Herod. It's like, f- show me the miracles and I'll see if I believe. That is not how that works. We see in verses 10 through 11, it says, And the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod with his men um, of war treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in gorgeous robe. And sent him back to Pilate. So we see that there was more anger. And from a point to where he's just kind of wanting to see some miracles and entertain me, Jesus. Basically at this point, as everyone else starts to get all riled up, he begins to uh, despise utterly. Basically that word treating with contempt, the word means to despise utterly. And he begins to clothe him with a mockery. He begins to give him a nice gorgeous robe. It's like, here you go, king. Have this on. And what does he do? He puts this lavish robe on and, uh, robe on, and then he sends him back to Pilate. And it falls back on him. And I know it's not funny, but at the same time, it kind of is, because Pilate's, like, doing his best to get rid of him at this point, and, like, I can just see Jesus walking back to Pilate, and him being like, no, I got rid of you, like, this is not, I don't want to, I don't want to make this answer, I do, I don't want to be the final say on this, and here comes Jesus back to him, and now it's back on Pilate, Herod, Herod puts it off, Herod says, I, you know, basically, we're going to see that Herod says that he knows he's innocent, and, and puts it off, but you make the decision, Pilate, and so we have, a, we have a couple men here that aren't going to make good decisions at all. We see in verse 12. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. Doesn't sin have a way of doing that? Right? Doesn't the denial of Jesus have a way? The same way that we have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can, can I cannot even know you. I mean, it goes deeper with us, obviously, but I cannot even know you, and I can love you, and I could feel like we have known each other for years. Have you ever met a believer like that, where they walked in the room, and it was like, your spirit and their spirit, and just, you were like, oh, we're best friends. It's super weird. It's totally good. Like, God loves you. God loves me. Let's be friends. You know? Same way, it's like, oh, you're going to hell? So am I. You're denying the Lord and, you're, and, and you are here doing all these things of the world. So am I. Let's do it together. And there's a camaraderie in that. And, you know, it's one of those things that people don't like to be in that alone, right? So instead of reaching out to who they should, they reach out to other people to do it with them. And so we see this as, and they became friends with each other. They had previously had been in enmity with each other. And I think that that's a scary thing to watch out. Because this kind of denial and these kind of people like to be around each other to somehow have comfort for one another. It says that Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, so he has them all in front of him, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misguides the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. Nor neither did Herod, for I, sent you, so I, for I sent you back to him, and indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. So this is the second time that he's saying, listen, there is nothing wrong here. I know that you guys are wrong. And what happens? He says, I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. So you got to release a prisoner at the feast, it says, and they all cried out at once, saying, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. And then I love that it explains to us who Barabbas is, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Take Jesus away who threatens, uh, you know, our law and these things and our comfort and give us a murderer, right? We want the murderer to come out. And Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. Basically, he's trying to talk to the, the, the crazy crowd at this point, And they shouted, saying, crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, why, what evil has he done? I found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and the chief priests prevailed. Man, that's, that's, a, that's a scary thing. When one person's... Um, knowing that someone else is right, knowing the truth, and they are swayed by a group of yelling people. 
says in 24, so Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one that they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Pilate knew the innocence of Jesus. He's caving to popular demand. He's caving to the pressure. His fear of man led him to a poor decision. They began to yell, release Barabbas. Release Barabbas. Well, what should I do with Jesus? Crucify him. Man, when I think of this in, in this verse and in the way they're doing this, I, I, my heart always wonders what Barabbas was thinking. Right? There could have been people in that crowd that maybe he murdered their family or something. And he's looking out the window. And I've always saw this, and this is not in the scriptures, but my mind kind of goes there. Like, I'm there with them. Like, my mind, when I read, it's like a giant picture book. Like, but basically, picture that. They're just yelling, crucify him. And he's sure that his time's up, right? Think about that. Like, okay, they're going to crucify me. I murdered a bunch of people. There's a rebellion that happened. I'm dead. And then all of a sudden, they see him. Gee, they come in. Okay, Barabbas, you're released. And th- there's Jesus that walks by. And they're like, what did he do? Oh, we don't know, but kill him, you know? Right? And you have Pilate going, this man is innocent. I don't know why you're killing him. Not on me. Not on me. Right? And I think it's the first time that if someone really wanted to accept Jesus, it could have been Barabbas. Right? If he's looking at this and literally someone dying in his place, taking the cost for his sins, could have happened right and very well there. We don't know what Barabbas did after this point. We don't. But boy, if he did, if there ever was that time, that would be the first like literal, literal payment of someone else's sin, someone else's death that, that Jesus took on for himself. So it says that Jesus was delivered to their will, and that's half right, okay? Because he was delivered to their will, but we knew that he is delivered to the will of the Father. We know that on Satan's best day, the one thing that Satan thinks he's going to do by killing the Son of Man, we know that that was the one thing that would redeem humanity. So yes, he was released to their will, their, their will but also, too, he was released to the will of the Father, We know that Jesus was in the garden. He was praying, Lord, if there's any other way, sweat and drips of blood coming off him, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. There was no other way. And he's seeing that right now. He knew that that there was no other way. And he was delivered to their will. He was delivered to the will of God to pay for the payment. And he went willingly. So now we have this amazing truth. We know that Jesus is about ready to die. We know that the next time we're here, that we're going to see that. And and as we know that, and we know about our Savior, and we know that how boldly he went to die for our sins, we think to ourselves, how could Herod and Pilate, uh, you know, cave like that? You had the power to say, Jesus is an innocent man. I release him to defend him, and yet you didn't. The Son of Man, I mean, the Son of God is right in front of you, and you choose to let him go with the people that want to kill him? You know, and... In our lives, we have the same exact opportunity on what to do with Jesus if we are going to cave to others about our thoughts on Jesus or on our faith. Who is Jesus to you today? As Jesus stands before you and you stand in the part of Pilate or Herod, who is Jesus to you today? Are you looking down at a miracle worker? Is that who Jesus is to you today? Are you looking at the person that is going to death for your sins on his shoulders? Because that's the person that we need to be seeing. The person that loved us more than anything in the world to sacrifice his own life at age 33 to go and die for us. And us knowing all this and us studying the word, how often is it that we, we cave to others? 
because of maybe what the crowd might think of us if we say something or we, we witness to that person at work. I've heard a pastor say, you know, listen, there's a, there's a difference. You know, here's the deal. Work is work. You never mention God at work because, and, and this is a real pastor that I know personally, and I was literally like throwing up in my mouth. You are literally never going to even share that you love Jesus to these people. Well, they should see it through the way you act. Well, you, rightfully so. But they should also know that Jesus is on your lips. That you know that that's the person that saved you. Don't compromise your walk. Be the one <laughs> to hold on to Jesus and what he did for you. Don't for one second care what the person next to you has to say or has to think. You worry about your relationship with Jesus. And I, I don't mean that because the Lord, I mean that, but I mean like the Lord loves you, so you don't really have to worry about that. The minute you're saved, you're saved. But just to have that be the only thing that matters in your life, are you pleasing to the Lord today? Are you walking in a life that loves the Lord? Are you walking in a heart that, that wants to strive to look like him, to be like him? He was the one that saved us tonight. Man, let's, I'm going to have the worship team come back up here. But let's cling to Jesus. Let's, you know, let's not only just give our hearts and our ears to him, but let every decision we make go by what he says, right? Nothing else. He is faithful to us. Don't be one of the people here that have the wrong thought of who Jesus is. Before a God of, you know, before a God of miracles and all these things, he is a God that died for you. He is a God that loves you. He is a God that sympathizes with you. He was a God when there was no other way, thought you were so special that he went and he died for you. And we end Sunday nights every time like this. And I, I kind of make my messages to where they end in a spot where we have things to pray about. But like I said today, for, the, for us that follow Jesus and for us that have been following Jesus for a while, we believe in miracles. We have faith that miracles happen because God loves his people. So I want to encourage you to come up for prayer. I, I share this all the time, but my heart is, is to see all of us praying at the end of this. All of us spending time with him. I don't, I, I mean, I used to, I, mean, I understand going, it, it can be hard to share Jesus. I get it. I understand that you're, you're questioning, well, what if I don't know enough? Well, I guarantee you, you know more than they do. Even if it's, listen, I was this and now I'm this and Jesus died for my sins, that's maybe more than they've ever heard. And so what I want to encourage you guys to do today is just pray. Spend some time here with the Lord. If you need a miracle in your life today, let's, let's lift it up. Like I said, God did it for people. And let's just be a family here, right? Let's not rush off. Let's get to know one another. Let's build one another. Let's sharpen one another. So we're going to go ahead and pray. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we just love you and we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you that uh, just as we read your word and Lord, we see things like Pilate and Herod and all the people that are yelling and all the confusion and all the, the caving of their morals and the caving of sending an innocent man to death, even though they knew better, Lord, we knew that everything that was happening, Lord God, was according to your will. Lord, we know that on Satan's best day, Lord, he couldn't, he couldn't have a victory. Lord, you allow anything to happen, Lord. Nothing, nothing happens outside of your will. And so, Lord, as we just, um, Lord, surrender our hearts to you here, Lord God. Maybe some of us, Lord, have been the ones where we focus more on our life and the miracles that we have and, and these things more than we focus on you. Lord, I pray that wouldn't be so. Lord, I pray that our hearts would just rejoice in who you are. Lord Jesus, thank you for being in control of our lives. 
Lord, I just pray for people in here, Lord God, that have addictions. Lord, I pray for people in this room, Lord, that need healings. Lord, I pray for people in this room that need restoration, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would come here now and Lord, that you would just speak to your people, that your Holy Spirit would move around this room, Lord God. Lord, I pray that no one would just take this time for granted, Lord, the time that we can spend together praying for one another, Lord, rejoicing in what you've done, praying for our needs. Lord, I, I, just, I just pray, Lord God, that every person here, Lord, would somehow either look to the person next to them and pray, or to pray in their heart, or to come up here and receive prayer, Lord God. Lord, speak to your people. Lord, thank you, Lord. Before We haven't even gone to the part, where, Lord God, where you go to the cross and die. But Lord, we have seen the mistreatment that you've had and that you did it for each and every one of us because there was no other way. So Lord, every single one of us, Lord, we thank you right now. We thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross for us. Lord Jesus, move afresh in here tonight, Lord. I just, um, as I pray, Lord, I have uh, just a feeling in my heart, Lord, that there's been people in this room whose faith in you has gotten stale. Lord, they were on fire at one time, but then the times of life come and, and things happen and it's so easy to just become complacent with how you're living. Lord, and I just pray that you would give them that fire back, that you would give them that zeal. Lord, that their word, their, the, 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 the name of you would always be on their lips, Lord God. Lord, give us strength. Lord, give us all the areas where we're weak and Lord, we, we have a hard time sharing because we're afraid of what we're going to say or what people are going to think. Lord, I pray that we would remind ourselves that you are the only thing Thing that matters, Lord Jesus. Lord, all we want to do, Lord God, each and every one of us in our heart, whether or not it always looks that way, Lord, is to be pleasing to you. Lord, let me be pleasing to you. Continue to strengthen us. Continue to move us. Continue to give us that calling, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we just pray for anyone in here once again that needs prayer to come forward. And we love you and thank you in Jesus' name.